I have the task of talking about Ghana and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, very fine topic. Um, but I first have to uh, raise a few uh, concerns about how the two uh, can be brought into a confluence. Because when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we talk about something that started sometime in the 15th century, well, around that time. And when we talk about Ghana, we're talking about modern day Ghana, we're talking about a country that emerged sometime in 1957. So the, the time difference is so wide. However, we can still create a confluence of, um, of the two if we first discuss first and foremost where the name Ghana came from and then we can talk about the transatlantic slave trade and then we can talk about the impact of the transatlantic slave trade on a modern nation state. So, um, Ghana, modern day Ghana, many of you will know, was named after an ancient empire um, or kingdom that emerged sometime uh, somewhere in the Sahelian region of West Africa. The Arabs referred to that zone as Bilad el Sudan, the land of the blacks. And Ghana was the first of three major empires that emerged there. Ghana was first followed by Mali, and it was followed by Songhai. And the three, area, the three empires all developed between the zone from, first starting from the River Senegal, the mouth of the River Senegal, to Lake Chad um, and the Nile to the east. And also from the Sahara Desert to the fringes of the forest zone in, uh, close to the coastal regions in West Africa. But ancient Ghana, which was renowned for its gold and artistry and intellectual you know, culture, was destroyed by jihadists. Muslims uh, who were fanatics, but they were of Berber extraction. Berber extraction, the name was Al Murabit. So Ghana lasted from about 580 to about 1240. And as I said, was weakened by the jihadist Al Murabit, who first attacked sometime in 1076. This was followed by the emergence of Mali. Mali being founded by. Uh, a great leader by the name Sunjata or Marijata. And this started sometime in mid 13th century and it grew, and by 1400 it had <coughs> waned, its powers had gone down. And instead, the vacuum that it left was filled by another African kingdom, another, I, I don't have to use kingdom because that is a misnomer, another African chiefdom mm -hmm. or empire. We don't really have kings in Africa, and we may, we may talk about that later. Um, so Songhai emerged and the person who led the formation of Songhai and the, the development of this political economic empire in West Africa was a man by the name Sony Ali. And this was sometime in 1464. From that time onwards, other great leaders took over, one being Askia Muhammad uh, Ture, uh, who also you know, expanded the territories that Sony Ali created and made Songhai a great <coughs> empire. However, it was Islamic in its, uh, in its form. The laws were Islamic, it pursued a strong Islamic culture and the intellectual traditions of the land, although they were emerging from indigenous African uh, intellectual creativities, they, they also drew a lot from Arabic uh, ideas. This Chiefdom was also our empire was destroyed by Moroccans, Moroccan soldiers who, being Arabs, did not really or had this kind of uh, did not really like this empire that had been created by indigenous West Africans and also for for economic reasons wanting to create um, a kind of uh, trade system known as the trans. Saharan trade, which all the three empires had controlled and had derived a lot of money from, the Arabs wanted to create it, to control it, so the Muslims and the, 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 the soldiers from Morocco 
following the orders of a sultan by the name Al Mansur, attacked Songhai and destroyed it. That brought a lot of chaos into this area that had, you know, known some cultural, political sophistications for, for hundreds of years. Because when this political order was disturbed, um, a lot of rocks came into the area, brigands, and, and, and there was just chaos. So <clears throat> West African civilization, we must say that it suffered a big blow as a result of this, this, this greater uh, catastrophe. And uh, we, we will argue that it has never been the same. And when we go on, we also know other developments that came in and arrested West African development, as well as Ghana's development, something that we are still suffering from. Our development, uh, our natural historical progression got disturbed and got arrested. So I, I remember this group by the name Arrested Development. I don't know really yeah, yeah, yeah. the name. It's a great group. OK. So it is this that will ultimately shift focus from from the Sahelian region, which for a very long time controlled this Trans-Saharan tree, and bring it to the coastal region, where another form of trade system will emerge, and new chiefdoms will emerge on the western coast of Africa. Right about the time that Songhai was going down, if we say that so the, the Moroccans invaded and controlled <coughs> Songhai from about 1595, we must also know that the Europeans had then come to the coast of West Africa. So while these great empires were, or the last of the great empire, the Sahelian region was going down, European powers were also, you know, yeah, engaging in trade and imperial activities on the west coast of Africa. And they created the transatlantic slave trade and the transatlantic trade where now goods had to go not across the Sahara to Arabian, the Arabian world from West Africa and to Europe, but now across the Atlantic via the coastal ports. When the Europeans uh, on the wings of imperialism came to the west coast of Africa, um, they met indigenous ethnies, indigenous ethnic groups uh, on the coast. The first European country to, to, to actually you know, go out in search of trading partners and in search of land um, was Portugal. Now, Portugal was able to come out of the Iberian Peninsula, which is the peninsula of <laughs> Portugal and Spain, was able to come out to West Africa, along the coast of West Africa, because of certain um, factors. First and foremost, there was development in uh, technology, uh, especially in maritime technology and navigational technology, um, where Portugal and Spain, and then later other European countries, mastered the creation of caravels, or these ships that could travel long distance instead of relying on, on old vessels. Um, and these caravels had sails that could really help them to really move far. And so that, with the development and the mastering of the compass, as well as the astrolabe, allowed them now to feel, you know, competent and capable of, 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 of uh, exploring the deep blue, which is Atlantic Ocean. Europe had also been engaged in a lot of wars, including the, the, the Hundred Years Wars. They, were also, they had also experienced attacks from, from the Ottoman um, uh, Turks. And so Europe before, well, let's say, the, 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 before the beginning of their uh, 16th century, had been embroiled in a lot of uh, wars and did not have the time 
to, to engage in exploration activities. Um, and so Portugal being the first to free itself of such, such um, political turmoil and also wars, being able to uh, um, become free from attacks from the, from the text, and also Muslims known as the Moors from North Africa that had also taken the Iberian Peninsula. Portugal now had the liberty to go out and explore and see other places, plus the fact that they had the advantage of the caravel and the compass and the astrolabe. But there also the factor, motivating factor, which was the desire of Portugal to get to the source of gold from West Africa, which Portugal and other European nations had obtained through Arabs, through Arab middlemen. But because the triumph of Christianity, of which Portugal, Portugal was a Catholic state, the triumph of Christianity had antagonized you know, Muslims, uh, and there was now a problem between the Christian European nations and also the Muslim uh, nations. They were now not in a good position to obtain items from the Arabs who used to supply them. The Arabs used to take through the near North African agents, the Arabs in, in Morocco, in Egypt, and to obtain goods and gold and other things from West Africa. Now the Europeans, especially Portugal, wanted to get to the source. So they were motivated by an economic you know, uh, 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 need to get to the goal. And also, this is, this is tricky, motivated uh, by a kind of divine mandate to go and spread Christianity, to go and give Christianity to a group of people who are backward uh, in West Africa. So that will actually push the Portuguese to step out, and uh, they will be followed by the Castilians, today known as the, Span the Spaniards. They will also follow. So the Portuguese, uh, opened the door for the Castilians to follow sometime in the 1450s. Uh, but the, the Spaniards will abandon their West African adventure when Columbus discovers the Americas, and they would see it as a big, a big uh, uh, place to go and play, instead of just playing on the coast of West Africa, which was small. So they will abandon the uh, West African exploration sometime about 14, after 1492 with the Colombian discovery, so-called discovery of America, not discovery of America. Right. OK. And so Portugal then will take West Africa, uh, and it will create some kind of uh, uh, jealousy among other European powers, the Dutch and the English. And they will also decide to follow uh, the, Portu the Portuguese to the west coast of Africa. You must understand that now we're coming to West Africa, where, where Ghana is now. So this is where we're going to start. So the Dutch and the Portuguese, being rivals, uh, all wanting to have some kind of part of the of the economic cake of the West African coast, will will engage in wars, and uh, that the Dutch will conquer all the Portuguese trading posts and forts on the coast, including the Portuguese fort. They call it a castle, but it's not a castle. It's a slave dungeon on, the, on, 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 on this uh, part of Cape Coast, Elmina. The Dutch will take over after defeating the Portuguese. Um, but we'll come to how the Portuguese were able to build that fort here, and then talk about how they started to operate in Ghana. Other European countries followed. The Danes came in 1642. The Swedes came in 1647. And Sweden doesn't want to talk about, I was in Sweden, and when I engaged them in conversation, many of them don't want to talk about their engagement in transatlantic literature, like the Danes, the, 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 the people from Denmark. They don't want to talk about it. You know, and so I, I told them, you know, the historical records show that you were here. You actually built a fort. You, you enslaved people. I know, like, oh, but they, it's like that. We'll talk about that again in politics. And so, after the Swedes, there came the Brandenburgers of Germany or Prussia, uh, also in 1682. Uh, but they did not really su succeed in the uh, economic enterprises here, so they, they left. The Swedes also left. 
and the Danes withdrew. The Dutch stayed on until about 1872 and left. So Britain will become virtually the imperial mistress of, West, of, of, of many of the West African countries, especially the Gold Coast, which will become Ghana. The French also came and also they were able to remain. And that's why West Africa will become <coughs> very Anglophone and Francophone to be colonized by these two after the, the demise, the so-called demise of the trans-Atlantic slave trade, then they will get into colonization proper. So they will become the colonial mistresses of West Africa. show that the Portuguese reached Cape Verde Islands in 1444 um, and then they reached the Gold Coast, present-day Ghana, in 1470, 1471, thereabout. When they got here, they started trading with the Inzima, the Inzima as uh, one of the ethnic groups in Ghana. <coughs> and they also traded with the Ahanta, it's also one of the ethnic groups in Ghana. Asante will come later. At the time that they came, there was no Asante. The so-called great chief don't call Asante. There was no Asante. Asante is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a new kid on the block. So they were trading with the Ahanta and the Nzima and they made a little uh, kind of base at a town called Shama, which is not very far from Elmina. Before they <coughs> entered into the Gold Coast El through Shama and later Elmina, they had managed to penetrate into some Senegalese villages. And there they were able to capture some people say they were, they, some historians will say they took, but they captured or kidnapped about 10 people from the Senegal zone and sent them to Lisbon, sent them to Portugal. As, and they were enslaved because they were not free. And they said that some historians will say they wanted to Christianize them and use them as missionaries and use them as agents of the imperial enterprise. So they sent them to Lisbon and baptized them, and they showed them as trophies to the, the, the monarch of Portugal that we have actually reached that place where we wanted to go, that coast of the Guinea. And so these people were, were saying, so that was actually the emergence of their, I wouldn't say chattelization of West Africans by the Portuguese, but the emergence of their, the, the, the forceful, um, uh, taken off of Africans from the west coast of Africa by this, this Portuguese, uh, European power. They moved on and then in 1482, after they had dealt with the people of Shama, Hanka <coughs> people, they moved on and came to Elmina because they found that place to be very good and they thought that they could now build a fort there. But the people of Elmina, before Elmina got the name Elmina, the people and the land was known as Anomansa, which means that which, when you drink, it doesn't get finished. Anomansa, when you drink it, it doesn't get finished. And he talked about the, a certain river there that was always flowing with water and the people drank it. At the same time, it referred to the tremendous wealth of the people the gold there. So Anumansa was the name of the, the region. When you drink it, it doesn't get finished. But then Elmina came, became the name that they used for it as the mine because of the gold there. So when they got there and wanted to build this fort, the people there resisted. Their leaders resisted. The leader at the time was a man by the name Karamansa. Some people think that he was Arabized in a way. Others believe that he has some connections to the ancient empire of Mali because when you say Mansa in the Mali language, Manding language, it refers to a king or a chief. Let me use king. I don't like to use the word king. It refers to a chief, Mansa, like Mansa Musa, Mansa Suleiman. So they thought that he had some connections, but that 
should not be hard for us to imagine because Pan-African connections have always been there since I don't know when. Um, so they met this chief and the chief said, no, you cannot build this fort here. The reason is that you guys have been, we know you've been on the coast for some time now, trading with us. And we've been trading fine. We've not been trading in human beings though. Because at the time, they had not started trading in human beings. We've been trading in gold and other items. But we believe that you have an ulterior motive. And if you build a fort here, we will have a relationship that will not be cordial. Because, and he gave an analogy, he said, you see the ocean and the land. They are neighbors. But every day you see the sea trying to take the land. And the times you see the land also going into the sea trying to take it. So we will have conflict. So please don't build a fort here. The Portuguese responded that, you know what, chief? We want to build it. And you can't stop us. And the chief said, well, we will stop you. And they said, we have the means and the technology of violence. You don't have it. The gun. And so we will take it. And you don't also want to incur the displeasure, and I want to use this term, the displeasure of your brother. You use the brother here, the word brother, the displeasure of your brother, the monarch of Portugal. Saying that the monarch of Portugal was the brother of this African chief. I said, if you're my brother, why would you like to take what I have? So they said, if you incur his displeasure, we will raise this whole village down. So through threats and also some kind of bribery, because some people behind the scene took some, some few things, they were able to get the chief to break and they finally built this fort, which became the Elmina so-called castle, the Elmina slave dungeon. It became known as the St. George Fort. There, the Portuguese stayed and started to trade, engaging in in other items, gold, grains, ivory, spices, wax. So they had now come to the Gold Coast. Then Spain contacted Portugal and said, we are from the Iberian Peninsula. We know we can't come into your TEF. We are the, the, the boss here. However, we have a new TEF. And that new TEF, which is America's, is demanding labor. So we used to to, to, to stories about the strength of these, these West Africans, indigenous people. So why don't you supply us with African labor, which will be cheap? Because first and foremost, we have experimented with indigenous people of the Americas, the First Nations, and they are not used to the kind of hard work that we have imposed on them. So we think that the Africans, knowing how they were strong and robust in the Iberian Peninsula when they came in as the Moors. We know how strong they can be. Secondly, we are also aware that you have taken some to Lisbon, enslaving them and making them domestic, domestic slaves, not putting them on plantations. And we are also aware that on the islands of, of Madeira and also Cape Verde, you have used some of them to cultivate the land. So give us some because we don't want to just come in and take, because you're controlling the West Coast of Africa right now, and we are controlling the Americas. So they said, okay, then we'll sign a contract, that Asiento, and Asiento will give us the right to give you some, some, and a certain number of enslaved Africans annually. And this was a contract that they signed, and it really helped them, until some people who will be envious of the position of the Spaniards, the English and the rest will say, well, even if you have a contract that allows you to formally take enslaved people from West Africa through the Portuguese, we are going to come to West Africa, kidnap people, and send them to the Caribbean, and that will be the genesis of the piracy of John Hawkins, which I know many of us are know. Okay, so you had this going on, and that will actually be the genesis of the enslavement of Africans from, from the Gold Coast apart from other areas, because our focus is on Ghana, and I'm, I'm focusing on Ghana. So that will be the genesis of slavery of Africans on the Gulf Coast. So talking about the Gold Coast, you have a society where the ethnic groups had their own 
social systems. And this is where we come to the question of whether they were shocked by the new form, that the, the slavery that the Portuguese brought, and why some of them became part of the system. Was there a kind of slavery in the Gold Coast among the indigenous people before the Europeans came, before the Portuguese came? Or was this something which was novel? This is one question that I, I asked and I would like us to, 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 to look at. On indigenous terrain, the ethnic groups here, the Akan, the Guan, the Ebe, the Ga people, and the so-called Mole Dabani people, they all had systems that, in a way, make people unfree, but did not enslave them. It made people unfree, but it not enslaved them. And this is where again the, the issue of language comes in. Philosophy behind words, you know, uh, uh, comes in. Because if we say slave, slavery, we have to look at the root of the word slave then, and the etymology which is connected to Slav. So it comes with its own philosophical package as well as historical you know, uh, package, where it came from, what it does to a person, and who a slave is. In, on indigenous terrain, if you look at the languages of the, the Akan people, the Gap people, you find that that word which has become like a synonym uh, or which is comparable to slave does not chattelize a human being. It, doesn't, it does not make a human being a commodity, something that can be sold. So, for example, the word for an unfree person in a can is donko. D O N K O, don't call. When you break the word into two, you have do, which is love, and inko, which is won't go or don't go. The idea is that if you have an unfree person, or if the person's unfree through any means, and we'll talk about some of them. You have to show love to that person. Because if you show love to that person, the person will never leave you. The person may even stay in your family. The person can marry your children. The person can work for you. So don't call love the person and the person will not leave you. So that is, that is something that we have to look at. All the other words, there was a word called bamba, which is like a game. People could obtain people and make them unfree through a game in the northern region. But people were not sold. People or human beings were higher than chattels. So they could not be sold in indigenous cosmology, in world view of the indigenous, of the African people on the west coast and the Akan and the Gold Coast. Human beings were not items to be sold. But the transatlantic slave trade was very different when it came in and did not see the humanity of the African on the west coast of Africa and also in the Gulf. Started to preach that the human beings was sellable. And so that started, as I said, the chattelization process of of the human being in West Africa. And people developed a taste. When we start to look at Foucault's idea of taste, people started to develop a taste for, for that. It became part of the worldview of some people who were not critical 
And so some of the indigenous people engaged in this trade. And many of us don't really want to talk about it. But we must again be critical because who was the person who brought this idea? He must be held accountable. Because first you must have a demand and then you will have a supply. So the person who was coming in came with a very, an idea which was antipodal to all forms of morality. <clears throat> Anything that we can consider holy when it comes to the separate nature of the human being, that idea was antipodal and it was evil. But then when it came in through bribery, and also within indigenous terrain, you also have, using this as a metaphor, Judas's. Some people were ready to, you know, um, betray their own. So, this was what happened to the social terrain where there was a kind of domestic, some people refer to it as domestic slavery. I don't like to use it because it wasn't domestic slavery. I would say it was some kind of domestic servitude, but not slavery. One book that maybe some of you would like to read is one written by a professor by the name Akosua Pebi, A-K-O-S-U-A, and then P-E-R-B-I, Akosua Pebi, she's a professor of history at the University of Ghana, A-K-O-S-U-A, and P-E-R-B-I, a professor of history at the University of Ghana. The title is Indigenous Slavery. I find a problem with that because there was no slavery. I would say there was domestic servitude. The human beings that fell under this system, they could marry. They had, they, 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 they were not, they could not be killed easily unless they have really committed a crime. Um, they could grow to become even heads and chiefs in their society. We have examples all over where enslaved people here, uh, the, 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 the person who was under this kind of domestic servitude, rose to become a leader of a family. So, this was the situation, this is what happened on the terrain, and the, Brit the, the Portuguese doing it, the British coming in to join, the French, the Dutch, the Danes, all joining. So how were they obtaining human, how were they obtaining the people that they, they chattelized? Um, can I, excuse me, can I yes. ask that question? Yes. So, in, in, in just in general, is there a date when you can say that just the chattelization of the West Coast of um, Africans began? Would this be the 1470s or about when did that begin? Okay, I will refer to the first being 1441, where I said they took about, they kidnapped about 10. 10 people from the Senegal region and send them to Lisbon. But we don't have information about what happened in other zones, say Sierra Leone and the rest. Uh, but they continue taking people from that zone uh, to Spain in their hundreds. Um, and that was why when the first asiento was signed between Spain and Portugal, the people, the Africans that were taken to the Americas were taken from Portugal. The store of Africans in Portugal, they were taken to, to, the, to the Americas. Then later they said, we'll take it directly. So you have also John Hawkins coming in, the British side, coming in and kidnapping people from the Sierra Leone region in the, in the ship called Jesus of Lubeck and sending them to, yeah, the first ship called Jesus of Lubeck, taking people from the Sierra Leone region. And that was, I think, sometime in, um, was in 15, the 1530s or thereabout. Um, so we will then say that, okay, if we want to start, put a kind of date on it because we don't have, then we'll say that the creation or the building of the fort here in the Gold Coast by the Portuguese marked the beginning of chattelization of people of the Gold Coast. That was in 1482. Alright, thank you. Yes, that was in 1482. That was when they built this fort. So that will be the genesis of, of, of it. So, how were they obtaining human uh, from, from, from the, 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 the coast 
of, of, of the Gold Coast. Um, they were kidnapping. They did what they called the hit and run, uh, where they would just you know, take people on the coast, grab them, and send them into their forts or their ships or their boats. So they were doing that, the kidnapping. Um, and also they were doing what is referred to as panyaring. P-A-N-Y-A-R-I-I-N-G. Where they will seize people who are, in a way, owed a European or owed an African. So Panyaran was conducted by both Europeans and also Africans. So if someone felt that he, he had someone owing him, he will just wait and that person, if that, the time of payment passes, he will say that you owe me, you're not paying, and then they will just catch the person and give them to the European and say, well, this person owes me. So he so said, that's Panyaran. So that was one of the things that they did. When they really got established, and also the Portuguese being the first to build a fort, there were others that came and also built forts all along the coast. So they were all engaging in these things. They employed the, an old trick, which is a divide and rule trick, where they started to uh, create friendships, in inverted commas, with some indigenous ethnic groups, and instigated them against others saying that, ah, oh, we know historically. And in every family, in families you have problems. You even have a brother and a sister in at times having conflicts. So it's, it's a product of social, uh, it's a concomitant of social interaction. So you have that. And so there were, the ethnic groups on the West East, on the, on the Gold Coast, they were not all the time laughing and, and playing. They, were, they had problems. So the Europeans, the Portuguese, the English, and the rest took advantage of this and said, you know, we can arm you, we can give you uh, items to fight against these people who are your traditional enemies. And once you, you, you fight against them and you get their land, you get their resources, you also take human beings and you, start, you give them to us. So they used that uh, divide and rule te technique against others, and this will, will manifest strongly uh, between, for example, the, 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 the Dutch and the Asante people. Where the Dutch will ally with the Asante and then they tell them that you can now enslave the, the, the people who are not Asante. So the Asante will then go to the northern part of Africa, of, of, of the Gold Coast, and raid and have wars with them and take human beings and walk them all the way from the northern part of the Gold Coast and bring them to the coast, especially to Elmina. Because the Santi could not come to this part of the coast, because this part of the coast belonged to the Fanti people, the Cape Coast people, the Fanti people. And the Fanti people and the Santi had were not friends. So they will go behind Cape Coast and get to Elmina and give the, the human beings to, to, to the Portuguese and also um, to, to the Dutch, not the Portuguese, to the Dutch. The Fanti were also, some daring businessmen were also get in touch with some of the Asante slave raiders and get the human beings and then give them to the British because the British were friends of, of, of the Fanti people on this side of the coast. And so you had that, of that, that situation of divide and rule where they were always fighting. Um, Europeans, and some historians will will debate it and say this is not correct. Some Europeans also created raiding gangs. They said that, oh, the Europeans were always only operating on the coast and they were not daring enough to go into the interior. But some Europeans were daring that they created gangs with some African auxiliaries and went into the interior and, you know, not deep, deep into the interior, but just on the, on the fringes of the coast, the forest, and raided villages and brought the people to the coast, put them in barracoons, like small, small shelters, and later into the, 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 the fort, and then to the ships and send them away. But another thing that I would like us to talk about is the use of what I refer to as chemical persuasion, where the Portuguese and all the Europeans introduced a kind of drinking culture among some of the ruling, you know, uh, I don't want to say class, the group, 
um, one of the items that they often would give to chiefs and, and the, the elders and people that were, were leaders, so-called traditional leaders in the society, was rum, alcohol. And, and that is chemical persuasion. It's, this thing is still being used by some powers that be around the world, where indigenous people, many of them have been turned into alcoholics because of, of the use of this. So they start to move away from the real issues leads them to become alcoholics, they, they, they lose, uh, they don't have anything to live for, many of them commit suicide. And this is found in Australia, I'm sure that this is also in the United States, especially among the indigenous, uh, indigenous people, where people are. So you have that, that plan, <coughs> chemical persuasion. And so you had chiefs becoming drunk, and wanting alcohol, and many of them had started to really, you know, lose Focus of the of the sacred worldview that he had about human beings and started to really sell people, uh, and therefore became corrupt, became allies of of of, of the indigenous of the of the Europeans. They started also to exchange guns, giving them guns. So this can make you powerful. So the gun was also another thing that they used for to get many of the indigenous people, their chiefs, to to support them. With the gun, they could get people, but at the same time, it increased the imperial ambitions of some states. Because with the guns, they could attack and expand and now grow to become big so-called empires. And that is one of the things that we have to look when we're talking about some of the indigenous uh, states that became big and powerful in the west coast, of, in, in Ghana, in the Gold Coast. For example, the Asante people, the Dentura. They all became powerful. We talk about them, the Great Asante Empire. We talk about the Dentura. We talk about that. But many of them became powerful and grew because of the new technology of violence that they acquired from the Europeans and were able to subjugate other Africans uh, in the Gold Coast in exchange for enslaved people for the, for the Europeans. Criminals were also dispensed of by chiefs. You had chiefs that were also just dispensed of criminals because, yes, now there is demand for human beings, and if you're a criminal in the society, now I can sell you off. So the chiefs were selling criminals. Um, and also, prisoners of war were also sold. Initially, prisoners of war were not sold. You know, they were kept, made to work in the mines and also in the farms, but now they could be sold. And debtors, who, people who were also owing people could be sold. Now, question? Yes, please. Couple, couple questions. Number one. Uh, yes, I must say that you have the right to, uh, you, you can please ask me questions as I, as I speak so that <coughs> I can. Explain some things. A couple questions. Number one, you talked about John Hawkins. I wanted to get your perspective on whether these are seen as nation state enterprises or whether they're seen as individual enterprises by conquistadors. How do you characterize? The second thing I'm asking is how do you characterize that period from the 8th century to the 12th century when the Muslims also took Africans from the Sahara region, the Sahel region, and took them back? Uh, whether it was to Egypt, whether it was to the other parts of the of the Muslim empire extending to China. How do you characterize those forms of bondage or slavery, etc.? Yes. First, I, I will start with the John Hawkins one. I don't think that John Hawkins was, was working as, he was a privateer, I mean, he became a, a pirate, a commander, a naval. I don't think he was working um, by himself. He was commissioned by the royalty. He was commissioned by the monarch of England to do what he did. First, he, he came with a ship that he was given. The ship was given to him. He could not get the ship. The ship was given to Jesus a little bit. And then he came to the west coast of Africa and Sierra Leone and took these enslaved, the first Englishman to do that, to take them and send them into the Caribbean, smuggling them in and giving them to the Spanish, um, the Spanish, uh, colonists there. It was then, therefore not part of, of nation building. However, it was part of the grand design of England to, to engage in 
the, 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 the struggle in the Caribbean for, for, for gold, for land, and also for money. Uh, because the, the Caribbean became what uh, um, um, a writer who wrote from Castro to Colum from Columbus to Castro, uh, Eric Williams, Williams referred to as the cockpit. You know, as it was a cockpit of struggles. So you had that really going on, and John Hawkins just went, but it was not part of England's nation-building enterprise. It was just a way to if can inflict damage to the Spanish monopoly and the Portuguese monopoly, that you have a formal contract that allows you to ens enslave and take people from Africa to the Caribbean. I don't know, we don't need a contract. We will take human beings by force and smuggle them into the Caribbean, whether you like it or not. And that's why they referred to the King of England said, show us a clause, a clause in Adam's will that the world belongs to Spain and Portugal. Okay. The other thing uh, regarding the, the Arab involvement is that we have two forms of Ma'afa, forceful taking of Africans. The first one being the Arab, Arabocentric one, and the other one being Eurocentric one. The Trans Saharan trade had been in existence for thousands of years, some even bring, taking it as far back as 3000 BC, others take it as far back as 2000 BC, where trade existed between the, the states in North Africa being controlled by Berbers, indigenous Africans, and also West Africans. For, for thousands of years, items from North Africa come in and items from, from the southern, Afri southern part of West Africa also go in. And some of these items going crossing the Mediterranean, even into Europe, the Iberian Peninsula, part of Italy. And some also going into the so-called Middle East, which again is problematic. But going to the Middle East and also the Arabian world. Now, Arabs got into it even before the emergence of, 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 of Islam. Arabs were involved, in, not as Muslims, but just as Arab traders were adventurers. But with the rise of Islam, you had Arabs on the wings of jihad taking the whole of North Africa. So you, have, you had Islamic bases in North Africa. And these also joined the trade openly. It involved now the end bond, making people into bondsmen and bondswomen, like enslaving them. But the Arabs had this slavery, which was not also like the European one. It was brutal. It was, but they all they claimed that the the Quran. Uh, enjoined them or made them to understand that it was better not to enslave human beings and so they could at times give them, allow them to go. But we know that it was only in theory because the Arabs, we know how they were castrating like African men, emasculating them, how they were putting African women into harems and turning them into sex slaves and stuff, how they were brutalizing and how they created a word for the African, which has become part of the Arabic language. It can be used derogatively, or it can also be used without any malice. And that word is at. So a certain worldview was created by the Arabs as they entered and started to enslave human beings in West Africa, where the word at became the known word for a black person. At means a servant. So the Arabs and the Muslims started to see Africans wherever they may be, as essentially servants. So when you say Abdullah, for example, it means servant of Allah. So at times people say, oh, but it's not true, because the word for black in, 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 in Arabic is as what? So even if you want to refer to as a black man, they will say as what? But they don't use that word as what? They use the word apt. And it can just be, oh, you're my apt friend, without thinking that he has used a, a bad word against you. So in the minds of the Arabs, even today, if they use the word and they think about it critically, they think that they are calling a slave, someone who is naturally a slave. So what they engaged in there was some kind of slavery, but it was, and it, it also fed Europe, I must add. Because some of the enslaved people who were sent to the Arabian world were also sent to Europe. 
some European who often come for, 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 for the, the enslaved people from the Arabs. That was when Europe and the Arabs and the Muslim world were allies until, you know, there was this kind of confusion, separation because of the Crusades and the rest. So that is where again now you find the Europeans saying that we don't even have to get items that we need from West Africa and other parts of Af Africa from the Arabs, including gold. And now they would like now to come to the source. I don't know if I... Yes, you did. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Yes. Who did the Arab-centric trade end? The Arab... The Arab-centric trade um, end? What's, what's your name? It didn't end, it was suppressed. It just I've heard that sometimes it lasted into the 20th century. Yes, 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 yes. That's the 19th century. Even today, it, people still travel the Sahara, you know, still trading, using caravans from North Africa to East, uh, to Mauritania, Mar Mali. Well, I, I meant the slave, the Arab eccentric. Yeah, it was suppressed. It didn't end because you still have people who are still engaging in the slavery on the ground today. It was just suppressed by, again, the French and the British, okay, when they started to abolish the years, so-called abolish the years, then it was suppressing it in, in, uh, in Algeria, in, in Libya, and, and, and elsewhere. So it was suppressed, but it didn't really end. That was like you said into the 20th century because the 1900s on was it was there it was still going on there. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is going back to what you said earlier when you said Asante allied with the Dutch. Yes. What was the Asante? I might you might have said it, but I think I missed it. What was the Asante reason for allying with them? Was it to prevent their own people from getting captured in slavery? Or? No. It was part of their determination to benefit from the trade with the Europeans. Secondly, they couldn't come to this part of town, Cape Coast, because the Fanti here were not their friends. As I said, you always had these ethnic groups and they were. So the Fanti preferred the Asante staying in the hinterland, and they, the Fanti, serving as middlemen in order to make profit. So they told the Asante people, whatever you want from the Europeans, we will supply. You don't have to come to the coast. But the Asante wanted to have direct contact with the Europeans so that they can get whatever they want without going through the middleman who was the Fanti. So now the Fanti also said, well, we will not allow that. And our friend the British will also not be happy with that. So the Asante said, then you are now our, our enemies. We, we will fight you and we'll fight your friends, the British. We have an ally, the Dutch. Again, the Dutch and the English, they were not friends. So they would rather prefer to ally with the Dutch. And then the Dutch will allow them. And the Elmina people, the indigenous people of Elmina, became friends of the Asante. So they allowed the Asante to come directly to the coast of Elmina. So they became friends of the Dutch and the Elmina people. And then they were supplying them. But, but the Dutch, they were happy because the gold, you know, that came from Asante was more than the gold that the British could obtain from some of the coastal, you know, terrains that they control, including, including Cape Coast. So it was part of Asante's desire to enjoy the benef benefits of, of the, the transatlantic slave trade and also to have a kind of protector, the Dutch, against the British because, you know, the British always wanted to go into the interior and defeat the Asante because the Asante, they considered them to be uh, terrorizing their friends, the Fante, here. So it was also part of the, the desire to have protection from the Dutch against the British. Thank you. Okay. So, this, this was the situation, and it became a situation of sell or be sold for many people. It, be, it created a, 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 an atmosphere of insecurity. You either sell or be sold. Because many people started just getting into it, just picking people and selling with other Europeans. Now, what effects did it have on the Gold Coast and West Africa? Was it beneficial? Unfortunately, some historians and some teachers in our schools in Ghana and other places in Africa will argue that the transatlantic slave trade was beneficial. 
they will argue that yes, it opened the door for colonialism to, to take place because when the transatlantic slave trade was so-called abolished by the British in 1807 and by 1833 it had, slavery had been abolished, it opened the door for what they referred to as legitimate trade, trading in goods that were legitimate. And then it also expanded the imperial and colonial ambitions of European powers to actually now colonize the, the countries uh, or the territories. And that will lead to British colonization of the Gold Coast. That will mean the setting up of an administrative system, including offices, including schools, including churches, so on and so forth, to serve the British. But some people today, some historians, will look at all these things and say, ah, if slavery had not occurred, if that had not opened the door for colonialism to come, some of these things that we cherish as markets of civilization wouldn't have been here in the Gold Coast. And there are teachers who would teach that and therefore would say that slavery was beneficial, colonialism had advantages. And they will even ask students in the high schools that enumerate the advantages and disadvantages of colonialism. Enumerate the advantages and disadvantages of slavery. How can that be? There's only one side, and that is the side that it was not beneficial and it was not advantageous, it was, it was something that was evil. And maybe when we're engaging in the conversation, we talk. So, the effects of that we can say that wasn't beneficial. Um, some will say that through, through slavery, some Africans were taken to, to Germany and to, to the Netherlands. For example, two Africans that come to mind, one by the name Wilhelm Amon, uh, who was taken to Germany and as a, as an enslaved person back then. His, his people, knowing what they wanted him to do, made him to study and he became a PhD holder in philosophy. And he taught in three universities in Germany. Uh, and then he came, he returned to, to, to Azim. But he was a factor, he was a colonial factor for them. Another one is a man by the name Jacob Capitain, who was taken to the Netherlands by the Dutch. And there he was also made to go to school. He became a missionary to come and evangelize for the Dutch here, the Dutch Reformed Church here in, in, in Elmina. And he wrote a thesis in support of slavery. This is just like, uh, I think, one of the, uh, of the poets or someone in American, African American uh, literature, I think by the name Phyllis Wheatley, who wrote about, you know, um, what slavery had done to him, to her, and how he saw, she saw Africa. Um, so it was not beneficial at all. Um, first, it affected the demography of, of, of African ethnic groups in, in the Gold Coast. It reduced uh, populations, a lot of people go kill, and also it, it created a state of insecurity which affected productivity, especially in the terrain, in the area of agriculture, where it became very, uh, people were afraid to go out to farm, because you go out and you will now come back home, a state of insecurity, as well as mistrust, a deepening mistrust uh, uh, between uh, ethnic groups, inter-ethnic relations in a way got, got, got uh, uh, disturbed. And this has continued even to the present period where you have some ethnic groups that today that will still look at others and say, oh, we know you. you, you, you are now our friends, you did this to us, I remember this and that. So today you still have people who, who although they may say they are Ghanaians, they will still you know, revert to their ethnic you know, identities and invoke the story about transatlantic slave trade and, and when their children want to get married and they want to marry someone from another ethnic group, they say, which ethnic group are you marrying from again? Uh, that group? Don't you know that these people did that? So, so on and so forth to us. So it has actually really affected inter-ethnic relations even up to today. Um, We can talk about the mystery, but it also created a travesty of Christianity, if there is anything to, to, to consider separate about Christianity. 
it also created that travesty of it, and, and in fact, gave us a very, some people are like, here, a very ugly image about Christianity, where Christianity today is, for many people, is, is just a, a political, uh, it's, 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 it's an economic gimmick and, and has nothing to offer. Considering the fact <coughs> that Christianity, or Eurocentric Christianity, had a hand in this whole enterprise, where you go to the, to, the, to the slave dungeons and you had a church right on top of a dungeon. And so, in the minds of many people, this kind of Christianity is, is not what we need. And some people have perpetuated you know, the narratives that that Christianity you know, are promoted, they still perpetuate that and continue giving that narrative today where they still make people think that it is wrong to rise up against tyranny. That it is, it is wrong to assert one's human dignity. Where today you have new slave masters under the disguise of, of going around as pastors and creating some of these churches to enslave people here. Enslave them mentally. So you have that, and I'm saying that this wouldn't have happened if the transatlantic slave trade had not come in. Because it was even, in a way, legitimized by the Eurocentric Christianity that came on the coast of West Africa. Quick question there. Yes, please. What do you think of the term overseer for heads of churches in West Africa? If someone says it's an overseer... Some call themselves overseers. Yes. Yeah. That's just a matter of semantics, I think. Really? It's semantics. Yeah, I think that what we, what kind of church are we talking about? We refer to them as the one-man church. Mm -hmm. People just start their churches. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't really <laughs> know. They just church. start a church. And of course, all churches are started by individuals. I mean, the church doesn't drop from heaven. It doesn't drop from... It's human beings start these churches. And so they have their own motives. Right? But many of the churches around here, because they don't want to go like we are, the founders say, oh, we are just overseas like a shepherd. You know? Right. You'll be seeing, again, trying to bring in this kind of biblical, you know, metaphor of I am the good shepherd. I'm just overseeing. It doesn't belong to me. But no, the churches belong to them. They make all the money. They take all the money. Right? So they are not overseers. It's just, just using a word that will, in a way, make them less dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, the term overseer is very offensive in America. Karis One um, has pointed this out, among others. Uh, but you would say the term is not offensive here? No, people, perverse people have not become critical. I'm not a, a victim of that, uh, of that system. But those who are victims, maybe many of them don't know that they are victims of this and they don't see anything wrong with the term because they have not been, they have not really deconstructed the term as you have done in America to know that it means something more than just a, a, a shepherd, you know. So yeah, now I. Okay. There we go. Yeah. 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 Yes, okay, please. You. Now, was Christianity practiced in different parts of Africa prior to the Europeans uh, coming over? Yes, please. But what, what is Christianity? Again, this is where we must be reflecting about it and try to deconstruct it. Because, the, and I'm going to talk about this person that we refer to as Jesus as a historical figure done a biblical thing. Because immediately I start to, to look at him through the prism of the Bible and become biblical about it, I will not see him as a historical figure. From historical records, <laughs> I mean, I think that we can find a lot about Jesus. We find a lot about him from the Bible. And when we take the Bible as a scholar, as a scientist, I will not agree with many of the things in the Bible. I don't think that anyone can tell me that it was a Noah's Ark that actually existed, and all the animals in the world found refuge in that Ark, considering the factors and geographical forces that shape flora and fauna of the spaces. Wherever this thing might have happened, one couldn't have found polar bears or penguins. One cannot talk about a man pointing a rod to the sea and opening it. So all these I don't really, so I can't really 
then take the Jesus from the Bible and use him. So we look, we look at the biblical, the, the historical records. Yes, the records. There are records. Feel them. One written by Joseph Flavius, and he talks about it. What's the title of that that work again? The, the, about the Jews. Antiquities of the Jews. Antiquities of the Jews. And in that, he doesn't really mention much about this man. There was a man by the name Jesus Christ. So that man started a kind of intellectual movement. We know he had followers, and this movement was considered to be, in a way. Uh, they refer to it as a set of the, the Hebrew halakha. Because I don't think there was anything like, you know, like uh, the, 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 the way of the Hebrew people, they refer to it as the halakha, the way to go. So it was part of the culture of the people. And his teachings traveled far. But when we look at what became known as Christianity today, when, or Eurocentric Christianity, we see it as part of the imperial enterprise of Rome. And so that did not exist in Africa. But the teachings of this revolutionary, not the feeble kind of Jesus that we have you know, around, the teachings of this man traveled to Egypt and traveled to Ethiopia and part of present day Sudan known as Numidia. But they had not reached West Africa, I must say. So some of the teachings of this revolutionary existed in, 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 in Egypt. Ethiopia, Aksum, and also also Nubia. But later, the Romanized or the Eurocentric kind of Christianity, which of course would develop under Constantine, will permeate and find find uh, spaces in Africa. So if you talk about an idea of a man, then it, it found it it, it, it found that some kind of uh, it found enclaves in part of East Africa. I have two questions. Yes, real. One just goes way back. We were talking about Pan Yaring, I think it was. Can you just spell that again? Pan Yaring. Pan Yaring. Pan Yaring. Pan Yaring. Can you spell that? P A N Y A R R I N G. Pan Yaring. And also, just a, a minute ago, when you were talking about Christianity, yes, we were talking about um, the feeling that pastors or, what, or preachers or Christianity has made people passive in terms of opposing tyranny. Could you just expl explain a little bit more about that? Or, or state that again. And do you think that is that was the case then, and do you think it's still the case now? Yeah. Okay, so for example, one of the things that the enslavers who claim to be Christians, because the same ship that brought the rapists, the madra, the drug, was the same ship that brought the fish down. They were all coming in. So one says, I'm going to save the people, and another one says, I'm going to enslave the people. How can this be? Okay, so can we then say that they were all the same? The only thing is that one was wearing you know, something different, and the other one was wearing something different. Okay. So they all came in. And one of the things, the, word, the, 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 the biblical passages they use is, oh, servants be obedient to your master, right? Servants be obedient to your masters. Oh, Forget about it, all will be taken, you know, you will get it in in a certain cavern. The gold. The gold was right here. Okay. This narrative is still being peddled today by some of the over overseers of the one man church. Some of their pastors. They still so <coughs> instead of getting the people using the the, the, what they have created as a tool of, of liberation, emancipating the people from mental slavery. They rather use it to fleece the people, to enslave the people, still telling them that, oh, it doesn't matter. If you don't make it here, see, there is a, a place where the, the roads and streets are made of gold, and people still go there, and say, give me your money. They, they tell them, give, give, give me your money. I will, I will pray so that you have money in your account. See, there's nothing difficult for, for Jesus. There's nothing difficult for God. So in a way, you see them repeating the same narrative that get dispossessed here. Just as we have come to dispossess you, but there's something greater for you. In fact, if we, if we baptize you, 
If you're lucky and we baptize you, we're saving you. That was also part of the narrative of enslavement. If you are you are lucky that we're taking you. That was also not part of, of, of the narrative of the slavery. So today people are enslaving people instead of creating a liberation theology. Mm. They are Amen. not. No. So you have a different, they're still perpetuating the same thing. So you have these people, in Jamaica they refer to them as Bakra Massa, like the, 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 the European overseer, the Bakra. Right? You have new Bakra here, but they are Ghanaian. They, and this is not only a problem in Ghana, it's also a problem in other parts of Africa. So you have that, and that's what I mean by those, of, those who are critical, they now see Christianity as I said, this is that you guys, what is this thing you call Christianity? You know, even if Christianity, as any idea, can give us some kind of anything that we, we, we can promote it. Many believe that it takes, it has been used to take us from material progress to, to dreaming about spiritual progress. But even, you can't eat the cross. Mm. You need bread. Right. Yes. So, um, understanding that you're a scholar in the field of information, how do you construct your faith um, as one? I don't have a faith. So, this is a personal question. I don't have any faith. I'm not a member of any religion. I am I'm best to religion. Or you are your spirituality. My spirituality, yeah. So when you talk about my spirituality, my spirituality cannot be constructed uh, from from anywhere. I construct my own spirituality. Where now you want me to the personal I'm going to be okay. I construct my own spirituality where I am, if there is anything called God, I am part of this God. I am God. I'm part of this goddess, and I'm the goddess. Because that was it. Before contact, there was no religion on the indigenous terrain. And then this, is, this is something that I would like you to explore. What we have come to accept African traditional as an African traditional religion is again a Eurocentric <coughs> Construction. Someone looking at what exists on this terrain or existed and defining it. So it's important for, for the person here now to have the power to define. Many of us have not really tried to have that power to define our realities. So if you say religion, what comes to mind is that it should have some kind of uh, you know, it should be faith based, it should have some kind of founding. Right? On the African terrain, there was nothing. There is nowhere for religion. There is nowhere. <coughs> like, for example, as I use the, the Hebraic example, the Hebrew worldview, uh, you had what? I think it's called Halakha, which is just the way, you know, how you live. Right? It's just like the Chinese Tao, the way. Um, so on the African terrain, and I'll use the, the Akan or, or the people of the Gold Coast, all the ethnic groups just had their well views, what to eat and what not to eat, when to go to the farm, when not to go to the farm. It didn't come from a law bearer, okay, with, with some tablets and saying that you have to follow these things, okay, with, with, with doctrines and doctrines. Going to a certain space. No, it was just just living and knowing how to relate to another human being, knowing how to relate to the plant. Because there is a saying, a maxim among the Akan, the Akan ethnic group is what is the largest ethnic group in Ghana, as you said, with others in the Ivory Coast, in the Ivory Coast of Cote d'Ivoire. There is a maxim, a wise saying, um, which really reveals the spirituality of the people. And it says, it means no one teaches a child about God or the goddess. No one. You just come into society 
and you just elect. You know where to go on a certain day or where not to go. No one teaches you, you just, it's just part of your culture and that is your spirituality. Religion, uh, here the, 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 the concept, when you say, you ask someone, please give me the, uh, the, 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 the gun word or the tree word for, and these are indigenous languages here, for religion, they will say, Nyameson. Hmm? Tree, for example, they will say Nyameson, which means worship, worshiping God. <coughs> Nyameson, or seven God. But this religion, it, only about worshiping God, yes, in a, in a context, yes. But here, how you deal with your brother is considered spiritual. So you have spirituality. How you treat the, 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 the land, the trees, it's just spirituality. Understanding that we are all interconnected and everything is in us and we are in everything. That is the spirituality that we, well, I would say we, meaning the, the indigenous, you know, our society have. But of course, there have been changes because of new ideas. Yes, maybe a follow out too. So when you when you talk about um, like how we treat our brothers or sisters, or how we treat the trees, or um, wherever we may go inside of the world, um, I feel like even that is a part, I guess, of some like some morality, you know. And I believe within that, in a sense, it can be interconnected with some type of religion um, of some sort, even if it's like a subconscious thing, you know? And like, like um, I don't think that's extreme, I can say that. But I, I, I don't know, it, you know, it's kind of difficult to work, you know, through that, um, but thank you. Yes, my brother. So, what, what normally I, I say, uh, I always, I don't like using African traditional religion. As I said, there's no relation. I like to use African spiritual beliefs and practices. Okay, African spiritual beliefs and practices. That's what I like to use. To say African traditional religion, then I'll start to ask you the characteristics of religion. Because again, you are, you are bringing an idea which is not indigenous. You're bringing an idea from outside and using it to explain the African reality. Religion. The word is coming from somewhere, the, the philosophical package that comes with it is not African. So immediately you start to describe what pertains on in Africa or what is here indigenously, then you are going to mold that to fit the Eurocentric frame of what a religion is. So, okay, so, so, we just, I guess, um, <coughs> deconstructed spirituality, right? So even within that, and we talk about like how we treat our brothers or our sisters, and so it's like we understand that that, and then if, you know, we say like, uh, if if there's any knack of who God is, then I am God, or I'm part of who God is, mm -hmm. and then the way that we treat our brothers or our sisters, even on a daily basis, it's not all good. But it's like when we think about God. I don't necessarily see evilness, but I see good. So it's like even when we talk about spirituality and what that means for our life, it's, it, it's like in a sense where it's saying like if that goes on the coast and not with you, our brothers and our sisters, then it's like then our God, then our God is not just good, then our God is also evil. So it, it, and, and I'm saying that like in a sense because it's like I think it's more so the separation of how. My spirituality and my flesh is. It is not in the sense of it's like I see my flesh as something that's super evil or super, you know, bad. Mm. But it's like if I talk about this spirituality piece and who God is and I am a part of God, then it's like in a sense, um, it's like in a sense, then is the God I serve also evil and good at the same time? And if that's the case, how can that be? 
Is that a question? It's your own music. Are you music? Or it's just like I, I, mean, I, was, I was kind of like think, I was kind of like thinking it out, but no, really kind of like in a sense of of um, you know how we treat our brothers and our sisters, and like that's spirituality. And so it was like you know, of course, I'm thinking about um, like you know. This one, I'll let somebody else go. It's, it's different thoughts. Yes, please, you brought this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I please just, I want to talk to you for a minute. Hey, Marcus, I always remember when you're thinking about God, He is the creator of everything. So, like, you want to look at the good in everything, but the cause and effect, you still deal with bad things all the time. You put your with bad things to understand. So, you still got to be happy about the bad just as good as your happy about the good because both of them is still good because you still alive. And, and, and what I wanted to say is like the word the word for that, the word for what we speak about is duality. Yeah. For every good there is a bad. You can't have good without bad. So even if you want to look at it through the lens of Christianity, there are negative things that happen and that can be perceived as negative. So when when disconnecting from religion and accepting reality for what it is, there are bad things that are going to happen. There are negative things that are going to happen. There will always be evil. There will always be light and dark. It, it's, it's a part of accepting reality. And we can always push towards light. We can always push towards positivity. But outside of religion, um, bad and good exist. It's a part of duality. It's like I'm doing it. Okay. Uh, okay. So you mentioned how the Bible is a book of liberation but was used as a tool of enslavement of African people. And one minute, please. I didn't say the Bible is the book of liberation. Well, <laughs> well, well you hinted at it and the truth is it is. But oh. then, how can you how can and then you further discredit the miraculous nature of Jesus, but you look, but you acknowledge him historically, right? So then you say, I guess so here's the question that was raised earlier but wasn't addressed to the point. Do you think that Christianity would ever have reached the African continent in the extent that it did if it wasn't for the means of of slavery. Okay. The Christianity that we have on the African continent to a very large extent is Eurocentric Christianity. An idea molded, framed you in a European way and brought to Africa. But how was it done? If you talk about extent, how was it done? It was done violently. It was done on the wings of a political of political systems. People were bullied to accept it. Spaces were opened up for this idea to go in. So that is my answer to the extent. It is all over, but it didn't come because of of, of a miraculous, you know, uh, power behind it. Some will say, yes, yeah, it's God who, that allowed it to happen. But human beings did it. And they did it because it was part of their plans to control their people. That is it. So that's the Euro that's your Eurocentric view of Christianity. Yes. What is your other view of Christianity? Which other Okay, so one, the Christianity which we follow now, um, uh, he's actually has what his Christianity about multiple times in this conversation and like kind of left it at because everybody has their own different definition of Christianity and what Christ is. So it's like we're trying to get a definite answer. 
from somebody has, who has a different understanding in different spaces than what you've learned. Like he may have a whole understanding of where Christianity came from in Africa, but you have an understanding of where Christianity came from, wherever you're from and wherever, what church you went to. So you're, it's kind of like a flash, like you're seeing a whole other perspective, or you're seeing something with a different prism, and you're just trying to like, understand it, but it's something totally different. Like, we're in a whole other country asking about religion. Literally. So, so you're, you're saying that Christianity would not have spread to this continent if it were not for the Europeans enslaving African people. The kind of Christianity that you have right, right now, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's it, and it's hard to accept, but that's the hard part. I think, I think, that's, 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 another I think thing is with the book issue. We must understand that the, book, the Bible was written by people. The Bible, times when I have conversations with people, they say, the Bible says, no. The Bible doesn't have a voice. The Bible doesn't speak. So the Bible was written by some people. And certainly coming to the question of, well, the issue of being a book of liberation, that you said, perhaps I said that. I didn't say that. Because the Bible, in the hands of some people, and you must understand, they had their own versions of whatever they had. It was used as part of their evangelization enterprise, which was part of the imperial enterprise. Evangelize them. The idea was CCC. Commerce, colonization, and Christianization. Three Cs. They're all together, and that's why I said that the guy that was coming and drinking rum with his sword, ready to slaughter and enslave, he came on the same boat and ship with the missionary. Okay, so now if we are even to take the Bible today, we can say that any person who, because you start from the known to the unknown, any person who wants to, in a way, cause some kind of liberation, okay, or help some people to go beyond this mental slavery, can use the same Bible, which was a tool of enslavement, or a tool that was used, was used to enslave people, to cause people to have a kind of liberated mind. Deconstructing the Bible and taking part of it that supports people rising up against tyranny, people rising up against uh, dehumanization. And just as you have in the United States of America, York, the African American history, you had people who did that. Then McVessie, he did that. You had, I think, Nat Turner, mm -hmm. he did that. So you had what is referred to as, um, as, as liberation theology. Right. The tool that was used to enslave you, you take it back, you deconstruct, you break it down, and say, in fact, in this tool, they even, there are paradoxes. You see, that part of it tells you that you are a free man. That tells you that you don't have to just sit down, open up your arms, and think that manna will come from heaven because you have to work. So why is that pastor now, an overseer, telling you that bring some money and we will pray for you and our things? So the same, that, that's the liberation theology. I think Marcus Gavi and, and all those people, they try to do that. Yeah, our school is the school that Martin Luther King went to. Yeah. So I'm, I just wonder where you think he falls out on that, you know, because I'm just, you know, religious belief and Christianity in the church was either the civil rights movement. So do you consider him a liberation the, the, uh, theologian, like if he's the Anna Turner? And if not, what, how would, if not, how would you characterize him? Let's be respectful. I think Marcus, uh, Martin, Martin, Martin. Martin Luther King. Um, I think that he he was a person who tried to create a liberation theology. He was a black person who created a liberation theology. Um, there are different degrees. So what he did was a contribution to the to the building of this liberation theology in the American context. Um, <clears throat> I can't I can't immediately bring bring to the fore 
anything that he took from the scriptures and used it to to promote, you know, redemption. But I'm sure that you being really, you know, in the United States, you coming from there, I'm sure maybe some of you have some quotations or biblical verses that he might have used to, to, to support the, the drive towards, you know, liberty and freedom. So, yes, he, he was. But at the same time, he was also a person who was deep in his faith. And that is a time to the where even some of us as scholars, we, because we are still stuck in the mud of our faith, we can go that far and can go beyond it because that's when we go beyond it that we challenge our own faith. And then most of the time, many of us have this faith because of an inherent fear. And that's what I mean by Christianity was also valid because valid evangelization was, was, was done validly, not just only through the use of swords and, and, and putting down these people and say, we don't take Christianity, we'll punish you. But putting in their minds that if they don't become Christians and accept a particular way as the only way and believe in that and have faith in that, they will burn in eternal fire. That is in psychological values. So many people have internalized it and even if they find that their faith is antipodal to reason at a certain point, they are unable to go beyond it because of a certain fear which they have internalized since they were young. That if we <coughs> go beyond this, we will burn in eternal fire. We're going against our master. So it is part of, of the struggle that many, many African leaders and scholars you know, go through as they try even to use, to, 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 to break themselves and other people from this kind of, of Domination, which So there are some people who radically move away from it and say, and this happened in the Gold Coast in Ghana, for example, where one man by the name Akonfu Damwa, he became Akonfu Damwa, his name is uh, Vincent Damwa, who was a Catholic priest for about 25 years. He nearly became a bishop. And during 1982, 1983, when this country experienced a military coup d'etat, a coup d'etat that was referred to as a revolution by the, those who orchestrated it, people started to think of African renaissance and self-determination because that is what the coup, coup makers told the nation. That's important for, for Ghana to liberate itself from no, new colonialism and mental slavery. So there were people who started to think about this revolution. And this priest of the Catholic Church immediately left the Catholic Church and said, I've been thinking about it. I've been in this for 25 years. I have been at the top. And I see that this is not my thing. This is not who I am. I am an African, and this doesn't speak to the African reality. So he left it totally and said that I cannot, I cannot progress and contribute to what he considered African Renaissance and African, African, uh, African uh, freedom if I still hold on to this Eurocentric Christianity. So I would rather get totally from it and find something new. Because if I stay in this, I can only go to a certain level, level, and my faith in this system will stop me. You find it here, even scientists and other people still trying to teach. Here it is an institution of higher learning. Reason is king. And still they go to the classroom and they teach science. They, they are not able to put their baggage and package of faith home and operate in the four walls of the academia with reason. So even as they go and teach their students, okay, this is how science works. See, this is a problem with your disease. This is what causes this is the, the, the practice. They get to a point, dissect the human, and then they get to a point and say, and you see how wonderful God is. Yeah. After okay. talking about all the scientific, using science to explain, I am not saying throw away your God, but keep it home once you come to the academia. But they are not able to do it. So you get them still producing students, 
or people that they want to liberate, still getting them to only to be liberated to a certain point, not beyond. Yes, my brother. Oh, um, my question. Oh, he has been, he has been like. Yeah, mine. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, Sorry, I'll come back to you. Just a clarification question. In the previous African history class that I took, I learned about the African spiritual beliefs in Yoruba and how when African peoples were kidnapped and taken to like South America, <laughs> America and the Caribbean and forced to learn Christianity, that in order to describe, in order to disguise their African belief of Yoruba, they had to mix it in with certain Christian beliefs. So my question is, is, was there an indigenous African spirituality similar to Europe present in this part of West Africa before Christianity and today for Africans who do not practice Christianity, is there an indigenous African spiritual belief that they practice independent yeah. of any European or Western yeah. religion? Yeah, we have people who still subscribe to ways of their ancestors and do not really you know, subscribe to any of the Abrahamic religions or do not subscribe to the Vedic religion and it's from, from the East. They still pursue, they live culture, and they still uh, revere their ancestors, they still call on them, they still make libation to, tree, uh, to rivers, spirits and rivers, and forces and energies. It's, and it's individualized, it's not like that. No, collective. no, it's not collective. And the ethnic states, uh -huh. because they have chiefs, chief tendency is very strong here. Some of the chiefs have become Christian still, okay? But some of them are still, not, they are not Christian. So they are custodians, as chiefs, they are custodians of the spirituality of the people, the land. They, they lead rituals and other things and, 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 and help the people to develop, you know, their communities and farm together and stuff like that. But when you look at, Battery set. there is a debate when you look at the African spiritual systems, I mean, because Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent, as we said, and it's made up of different ethnic groups. You can find differences even between the worldviews of, of, of the, 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 the Akan here and the Gra in Accra. In Accra is an area for the Gra people, the Akan, for example, the Fanti people are Akan. There are differences, but when you really go deep down, you find some fundamental, you know, common ideas that they all share. And that is what people, scholars like Sheikh Anta Job refer to as the cultural unity of Africa. And not only the cultural unity of Africa, but the spiritual unity of Africa. Even in South Africa, not anywhere, you still find a connection. Uh -huh. The idea, for example, of Ubuntu is, global, is, mm. is, is Africa. I am because you are, you are because I am. And that is not like the, the, the Cartesian way of knowing whether you exist, which is, I think, therefore I am. I know I exist because I see that you exist. That you are my mirror, reflection. Without you, I don't exist. Because if I had just, if I find myself here today, if everything, if there is this apocalyptic catastrophe, and we all go, and there is a new F, and I find myself here alone, I will not know that I exist. Even if I think, I will not know that. I <laughs> yes, 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 Elder. Yes, Elder. Elder. Mm. How do you how do you discuss the the, the neck hair and the spiritual beliefs of uh, Kemet of yeah. Egypt? How do you discuss that? It's certainly not a religion. How do you discuss that in the context of what you're talking about? Yes, it is the same. And it's the same, uh, and that is where, again, you can even find connections with the Abrahamic religions that took a lot of inspiration from the, 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 the people of Kemet. For example, Islam was said, yeah, there's a 99 names of Allah. All the 99 names, if you, if you go into the Kemet worldview, they are Neter, Neteru. The manifestations of the one, just one four that manifests differently. And you can find that also here. I refer to them as abusum, the forces of nature. It is just one source, one power, of which we are all part. And in indigenous schematic spirituality, you have the power to become an eternal. 
And that's where the the, 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 the Greeks will come in and say, man, know thyself because the highest good is becoming knowing yourself and ultimately becoming like a God. So it is just one with different manifestations. And if you also look at the Brahmic religion, God is love, God is this, God is God is my defender, Yehovah, <coughs> yeah. Jehovah uh, Elohim, Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah El Roe. All these are names of the ultimate reality, but the names themselves are forces and manifestations. So it, it's the same thing. This was, um, was this all outlined in the Ma'at? The Ma'at is a basic, Ma'at is, is first and foremost, it is, it is, it is a legal concept, and at the same time, it is a term for the woman, the female force that represents order instead of chaos. But it's also a way of life that is, it's a moral concept, what you live with. So, all the, the writings of the ancient Egyptians or the Kemet people, they all emphasize not only the historical writings, but writings that are meant to guide humans. They all emphasize the concept of Ma'at. So, because if God is justice, then you see that Ma'at is justice. So it's the manifestation of the one God. Okay. And there's a book that I think many of you would like to read. It's, it's very, it can explain some of these things that I can't, it's called the Akan, Akan Doctrine of God. Mm. The Akan Doctrine of God. A.K.A. It's an old book. One of the rare books in the world. Akan Doctrine of God, written by a man by the name J.B. Dangwa. <laughs> JB, JB, his initials is JB. And then down quite Z A N Q U A H. Down quite a philosopher, but also one of the nationalists of the Gold Coast. Yes, please. Um, just based on the center of the conversation before we even got here, off of like the slave trade, what were the primary sources that you were using? Like any, any of the literature that you're pulling from? I'm curious. Me pulling from? Yeah, I based off like the slave trade. I teach history, so. I, this is something mm. that I know, but if you, there are many books on on. No, no, I was wondering if we were actually like if there was any references in which we were referring to, but it was just. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, my reference, but I can I can give you. That's what I was asking. Uh, okay, so <laughs> what, what books? Any like two minute text, like major books, major works, that you're just as the even this, this you can get this. This is a new work that he's my colleague. His name is uh, sorry. His name is Dr. Musa Tuarori, and he's from his African brother. He's from Burkina Faso, but he's here teaching. He teaches. Literature, African diaspora, uh, literature, post colonial studies. So, we, he, he edited this book with a brother from the U, UK, Tony Talbot, he's Jamaican. And this is it's called Fight for Freedom, a lot of resistance. So, you can find, so the, the books are many, but when we finish, I, I, I will give you a list. My brother, I'll give you a list of some, some of the books. Yes. Uh, my question was, uh, should black Americans ban Christianity even though it uh, helped us get through the civil rights movement before the value of the civil rights movement? I am in no position to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, should black Americans ban Christianity even though... Yeah. Yeah. I'm just telling you the truth. Yeah, and, and I would say to you, sir, in America, for African Americans, it's very hard. The passion that you hear in some of our voices comes from our history and the role that Christianity has played in us even being able to be in this spot right now, being able to look at you. Yeah. Just to apologize on behalf of some of the people, but their passion, because it's coming off kind of like 
accusatory in the sense of like what you're saying is not fact, but it's hard for us, like as Professor Thomas mentioned, Dr. King went to our school. As, as far as civil, as far as like history goes for the civil rights era, he was a pioneer of that era. He was a pastor. And that the black church and how what, what that did to carry us over. And I'm bubbling on my words because there's just a lot of emotions running through me right now. But I wouldn't I would hate for you to believe that we don't believe what we're saying or that we're not internalizing what you are saying because we are. Some of us are. And we're right. Yes, my brother. So, um, hey, being able to like actually look at different cultures from like an outside lens, and uh, I've been pretty much my whole life I've only heard if you want to hide something from somebody, you like put it in a book. But the only books that we're able to read, none of us read, like, or have read, to be honest, or it's, you know, like, when people go to tweet the little, so what was you, like, how, how should we go from there? Like, even to the extent, like, when you were talking about the Bible, but it doesn't even have to be religious, it's just our history background, like, we didn't write it, it's not too much, it's not too many books, it's not, it's more other people's writings and teachings that, we're learning from, like, what would you recommend for us to do for our own personal, uh, like, knowledge? No, I think, uh, like, for our own personal, yeah. that's not what I was going to say, our own personal progression. <laughs> like, because ultimately we're all trying to get the same understanding and get to the same point that you are, at least I am. So what would you recommend? I think that it is, it is a matter of being reflexive, reflexivity. Self-criticism first. Question. Questioning. Questioning your yourself and where you are and what you've you you have held as you know as someone would say your golden idols. Questioning that and breaking those idols down. Because immediately you start questioning and being reflexive, yeah. you'll find. Like those little gray areas, yeah. 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 it's not a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. But they are also, I mean, we talk about the production of knowledge in academia. There is still the hegemony, Western hegemony of the production of knowledge, where you have Western control of epistemology, axiology, whatever. Yeah, G, G, G. <laughs> um, but there is also that small group, that revolutionary group, some point that are also struggling, right? Yeah. From an Afrocentric, not one who <coughs> romanticizes the African part. Because even though I'm an Afrocentric scholar, I do not subscribe that movement that yeah. will teach myth as history mm. in the name of Afrocentricity. Mm. That is not scholarship. Mm. So we still have some books out there that we have to be very careful, even though we call ourselves people who want to know that those <coughs> books, because of a certain desire of a group of people or some scholars to project and make everything so good about the African myth, they teach myth as history. We have to be careful. But there are those who will also just use facts, science, and reason to produce. And there are some books like that. I'm not. I can't really stand here right now to mention names because you when know, I say books, I don't mean like actually tangible books. But I mean actually, well, I, I mean that too. But I also mean like gaining some knowledge from like somebody like you, or that's what I mean. To yeah. Incorporate it in the books. Like it doesn't have to just be reflexivity. Yeah. And also, we are we are so happy that we are living in a world today where we can. I mean, it would have been difficult for for, for many of you to return to to Ghana. To, the, to, to Africa. But today, many of us can travel. So knowledge is not only obtainable from as a classroom in the street, but you can also travel, <coughs> travel and learn. This should not be your first visit, your <coughs> first and last visit to, to Africa, not only the Gold Coast, but other parts of Africa, where you can actually learn from, from, from the indigenous terrain. Even though there are some also in the just terrain who have also lost a certain you know, amount of the knowledge that we need. And that is where you really have to come and let. If you, at times there is a problem, 
And that is an African problem as we talk about the unification, re-emergence of the African family. There was a problem because we've been away for such a long time. There's a problem that we don't understand ourselves there. And at times, do you have um, those on the terrain here seeing themselves as having been gatekeepers for many years? And some of our brothers and sisters coming in, and because they are used to a certain way of life, seeing things and want things to be done, they do not, they see that, yeah, many of the people here are not really living the way they want them to live. So at times you have some kind of, I would say, a new colonial mind. And this, is, this happened in Liberia, for example. Whereas when some of the African Americans, as part of this the American colonization society, and when some people wanted to really return to Africa, as part of the Pan African effort, they came in and they then became the new colonial colonizers, often people on the terrain, because of a certain feeling of some kind of superiority because of the Americanness. And this was something we must all find a way and a way to navigate and then create that platform where we all learn from one another. Uh, so I start with reflexivity. I just have five minutes more of the brother. Oh well good. Man. Yes. So I have a question. Kind of like what he said about um, kind of giving up that like that that chain to the religion and understanding that not everything is a straight line and that though there are some corrects, there are some like gray areas. Um, this kind of leads me, made me think about the idea of nonviolence and what you thought about nonviolence because I know in America we have a constant debate about nonviolence or violence and some people will use, uh, like Stokely Carmichael's quote, nonviolence only works if your oppressor has, oppressor has a conscience and our oppressor doesn't. And you could use actual historical facts and say that um, a lot of the things that we achieved in black progression became, came about because of something else. So for example, the civil rights era came, let's back up, the, us ending slavery came due to, from what I read, that uh, we would look bad in foreign relations to other countries and try and achieve certain things, certain items in our agenda. And that was the main reason that there was a push for the end of slavery by Abraham Lincoln. And it kind of makes you wonder if the liberation, the, the, the liberation theology that a lot of us have learned and were taught if it really is liberation, or is it just another form of change? Do you kind of see what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm liberation, I think that liberation is not an event. Or freedom is not an event, it's a process. That's a process. And you have to be conscious of it and defend and protect what you are able, able, able to get at one stage of the process. And that's why. In, in, in Africa today, yes, Kwame Nkrumah, when he gained independence for the Gold Coast in 1957, said that we must protect the independence and help other African countries to be independent so that we will be strong to protect the independence that we have. Otherwise, the, the person that we, we, we ask to leave us will always want to come back because you still have the resources that the person who enslaved you, who colonized you, still wants to use today. But talking about violence, non-violence, um, I, I, the whole idea of satyagraha, whatever, don't, you know, you, if you dialogue, you can only be violent in the face of someone who is violent when you have the same technology of violence of that person. Otherwise, it will be unwise for you to do that because you will be eliminated. You will be exterminated. Today, and that's also a problem because the person who is interested in suppressing you today, he only understands the language of violence. There is no, he cannot dialogue with you. It's just like, sorry to say, someone who is like crazily, crazily insane. The only way, and I, I always talk to my friends about it, if the person comes up to you with a machete or something, immediately you pull out the machete, that person holds, stays back a bit. Okay, but do you, do you have the machete now or you just have a pen knife? So if you have a pen knife against someone who has an AK-47, will it be wise to be valid? Because you will 
perish, you'll be exterminated. Then you choose to die trying to be free or to live and, you know, endure this whilst you're still plotting a way to be strong. So that's why, for example, Kwame Nkrumah was talking about the unification of Africa, not only to create a common economic order, or a, con a common economic policy and a common political policy, but also to create a common defense system for Africa, where we'll have an African high command and an African army that will defend African interests. So he didn't say, right now you should go and fight. No, he said, use dialogue, because in Kuma, proposed the idea of positive action, which was similar to Satyagraha, non-vowed, but just disobey, <coughs> just disobey. Nkrumah did not say, oh, go and fight, because he knew that it would be unwise. So today, talking about <coughs> I think it is difficult to have dialogue, but at the same time, you just have to find ways to, 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 to become strong and, and organize and centralize and unite, because once you move as a concerted, with a concerted uh, unified front, I think that you will really matter. But if we go as individuals, that's what Pan-Africanism comes from. Okay, thank you. I think that I have exhausted my time, and it's been nice and very... Good.